Hello everyone, this is a video in which I will be showing off some recent acquisitions of mine. These are books that I was able to buy with my last paycheck, say when, when I was, it was subtracted rent and other necessities, I had enough left over to get some very old and very rare books that I've been wanting to have in my library for some time. Um, I am, I guess, a professional philosopher. I teach philosophy, but I also uh, write on philosophy, and I'm trying to uh, expand my expertise in the history of idealism, in German idealism and Anglo-American idealism, and also, say, certain philosophers that uh, are at least tangentially connected with that history, uh, critics of idealism, and and well, you know pe people who um, responded to the tradition of idealism in a certain kind of way. Uh, so the this is what I was able to get with the last paycheck. With with further paychecks, I pa plan on expanding on uh, on on the this uh, uh, on this period this uh, period of the history of philosophy. And I'll share with you, say, um, the the future video, the the future the future books when I get them. So, so let's uh, let's look at uh, at what we got right here. Uh, first, we'll we'll start over here at the end. Say we have uh, a single volume edition, very very hefty. This is a, a single volume edition of uh, uh, Hermann Lotze's Microcosmos. So. This is the third edition. This is from 1888. You see 1888 right here. I believe the first and second editions came out in uh, 1887. If not 1887, uh, 1886. Okay, so so this is uh, the the product of of uh, two translators, Edith Hamilton and E. Constance Jones. Uh, Hamilton, unfortunately, passed away uh, in the middle of translating this, uh, this massive, massive uh, treatise by Lotze, which is kind of, kind of a, a synoptic account of, of life. And the rest of it was, was translated by, uh, by Edith Constance Jones. So Lotze was one of the most important philosophers in Germany after Hegel, after Hegel's death. And it, uh, say he uh, is a somewhat forgotten figure. I, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say forgotten. I'm sure there, there are plenty of people who are aware of the history of 19th century philosophy who have at least encountered his name and at least know the fact that say that uh, uh, a great number of other significant philosophers were his students. Uh, Josiah Royce uh, went to Göttingen and studied under Hermann Lotze, uh, as well as a good many of other people, including um, including James Ward. And Lotze was not only a very significant person in philosophy; he was um, he was also a pioneer in the development of psychology. He was a big influence on on William James and uh, Wilhelm Wundt. And a great deal of, of other people, and uh, he's someone I've been wanting to to read for a good while now. So I'm I'm reading I'm reading the Microcosmos right now. This is uh, about uh, fifteen hundred pages, and this volume is the second oldest volume of this collection. So that's from eighteen eighty eight. This two volume translation of his Metaphysic uh, is is later. This one is from from uh, eighteen eighty nine, I believe. I believe, and uh, oh oh, uh, something else I wanted I wanted to point out, but forgot to. This one is that this book uh, was in the collection of the University of California. Uh, excuse me, University of Southern California's library, and I just love the name of the of the person that the 
uh, USC library is named for it, James Harmon Hoos. And I looked up James Harmon Hoos. It was a name unknown to me. But looks like he was, um, say, the first professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. And uh, so the Hoos Library is named for him. And it's a very distinguished-looking fellow. And I have not been able to track down uh, any titles by him, say, uh, perhaps like, like Socrates. Uh, his legacy is entirely in those uh, that he taught and uh, has not left any writings for posterity. Okay, now these, say the metaphysics right here by Lotze, say this, this is also interesting, this, this came from uh, the Woodbrook Library, say the Woodbrook Settlement, this is in Birmingham, and this was a, Quake, uh, a Quaker college and a good deal of significant people studied there, including, say, a lot of uh, people in the suffragette and and um, and uh, feminist and civil rights movements in the United States. They went over there to um, uh, they went they went over there to study. So this was presented to the Woodbrook Library by the Woodbrookers in America in 1910. So they, they sent this over there as a tribute or, or even um, a part of their, um, uh, maybe, maybe part, part of a, a donation that they made to the school. So those, uh, those uh, Quaker students of this college who went to America sent this in, in tribute and in honor of their alma mater. So lots is lots is metaphysic. This is this is actually the second part of what was to be a three-part system of philosophy that he was writing. That unfortunately he didn't live to finish. He got he uh, the first the first part is his work on logic. So this is the second part, metaphysic, and the the third part would have been say on psychology. And uh, like I said, unfortunately, he did not live to finish that. So we, we at least have the the first two parts, and we might be able to uh, infer a good deal about what might have been in the third part from Microcosmos and from some of his uh, lectures on psychology that have been uh, reduced to writing, reduced to publication. Now, say this and the logic was a translation project that was that was set up by uh, by Thomas Hill Green. Thomas Hill Green uh, over at Oxford was a great admirer of Lotze, so very very excited about say the uh, uh, the the new direction that Lotze was taking, uh, kind of like a metaphysical interpretation of of nature and the mind, and he commissioned his student. Bernard Bosenkit, of course, a, a significant person in the history of British idealism, commissioned him to translate the logic and the metaphysic, and I maybe maybe something else too. But um, I, I know not uh, not Microcosmos that that went to uh, Hamilton and Constance. Uh, but uh, this this was actually kind of like committee work. Say uh, Bosenkit was the head translator and the editor. And uh, there were other hands involved in it, and one, one of them being Green himself. Now, so this is the earlier work of Lotze, but this is actually the, the oldest book that I have in this collection. Um, let's see, let me check, the, let me check the, the, the date on here. So this, yeah, 1887. So that's 1888 right here. This is 1887. Uh, let's see here. So that that would that would put it a uh, hundred. Let's see here. I, I'm terrible at arithmetic. Okay. So let's see here. Let's see, a hundred and thirty-five years old. I want to say, hundred and thirty-five years old. Uh, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Uh, yes, yes, one hundred thirty-five years old. Please, please correct me. You know, it. Like I said, I'm terrible at arithmetic, and especially when I'm when I'm being put on the spot. Uh, comes from my traumatic childhood of uh, learning my figures 
under the tutelage of Mr. Murdstone. Okay, so that's Lotza. Moving on to James Ward. Now, James Ward is someone I have been interested in for a good long while uh, from a book by um, Pier Francesco Basile on, on uh, it, was, it was primarily about Whitehead. Uh, I think it was called uh, Leibniz Whitehead and the Problem of Causation, or 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 uh, the concept of causation, something like that. And I had encountered Ward's name before, it, reading um, William James and reading uh, A. E. Taylor's Elements of Metaphysics, uh, and both both uh, laud uh, Ward quite a bit. They have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, but I, I never really looked into his philosophy until I read Basile's book. And it was actually kind of a, a turning point for me in, uh, say, that book, where I, I was uh, in the midst of writing my dissertation on Whitehead, and I was, I was kind of uh, coming, coming out of, of being uh, something, something like a Hegelian for about 10 years. I, I certainly consider myself to be an absolute idealist, if not an out-and-out -out Hegelian. Uh, but, say, while going deeper into to Whitehead and deeper into the uh, philosophers that had a great deal of impact on him, such as Leibniz and whatnot, I, I started to rethink my position from being, say, uh, an absolute idealist in the sense of, of uh, uh, everything finally coalescing into a kind of like a monistic unity. And started thinking about, say, the the uh, the possibility of a pluralist idealism as actually being uh, a um, a uh, something something that might have actually uh, work out a little bit better as an interpretation of reality, and nature, and the mind than the monistic philosophies that I've been looking into. And Ward was one of those pluralist idealists. Now, I've not been able to track down any indication that Whitehead had read Ward. I, ca I can't remember if I found any mention of Ward, but Ward taught at Cambridge. Ward was, um, uh, his students included uh, G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell. And uh, it, it's, to me, very unlikely that Whitehead would not have been familiar with Ward and his work. And there is a lot of surprising overlap between Ward's philosophy, Ward's metaphysics, and, and Alfred North Whitehead's. I, I, would, I would almost go to the, so far as to say to the point of plagiarism. But no, I don't want to go that far, really. No, no, no. It's, it's, just, that, it's just to say that uh, in, his, <laughs> in his later years, when he was uh, outlining his his philosophy, outlining his metaphysics. I think it, I think it just slipped Whitehead's mind uh, while he was listing off, say, the various people who are um, are an influence on his work, from from Bradley to uh, to Bergson and and William James and so on. Say, Ward Ward was just was just uh, left out absentmindedly. That's that's how I want to believe it. But I have here. Ward's two Gifford lectures. I have Naturalism and Agnosticism, which was his Gifford lectures from 1896 to 98, and his Gifford lectures from what was it? Was it? Was it? Um, uh, I can't. I can't remember. I can't remember. It was say the Gifford lectures. Pardon me. For the years 1907 to 1910. Now, not many people do the Gifford Lectures twice. Uh, and if you don't know what those are, the Gifford Lectures are one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, lecture series in philosophy. And some of the most significant philosophical works of the last 130 years or so have been uh, originally uh, part of the, uh, you know, uh, originally delivered as lectures. Um, at uh, University of St. Andrews or University of Glasgow or University of Edinburgh as part of the Gifford Lecture Series. And uh, say William James's Varieties of Religious Experience uh, were Gifford Lectures. 
Josiah Royce's The World and the Individual, were, were Gifford Lecture's uh, Process and Reality, the magnum opus of Whitehead, were Gifford Lectures. And I believe Ward was the second or third person to deliver the, the, the Gifford Lectures. So the, pretty early on, he's, uh, um, uh, he is uh, delivering lectures there. And then several years later, delivers them again. And we also have two other examples of the Gifford Lecture series right here. Say, uh, The Principle of Individuality and Value and The Value and Destiny of the Individual are the first and second series, respectively, of Bosanquet's Gifford Lectures. And when we get over here to the end right here, uh, here uh, Space, Time, and Deity by Samuel L. Alexander was also uh, delivered um, as part of the Gifford series uh, during the First World War. Okay, and uh, the lecturer, I believe, who came right after Ward uh, for the for, uh, for uh, natural and agnosticism, say the the next lecturer was Josiah Royce, and those were the lectures that became the world and the individual. And then right after Royce, uh, I believe it was William James delivering his lectures on the varieties of a religious experience. And that's what that's what the the, the Gifford lectures are about. They are uh, there are supposed to be lectures in which you're you're trying to give some kind of philosophical account for religious experience, where you find, say, something, uh, maybe a, 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 a grounding in natural theology or in metaphysics uh, for, uh, for religious insight, say, you know, or, or, or uh, uh, using metaphysics to, to uh, defend uh, a, a certain kind of concept of God's existence that could be compatible with religious experience, but maybe different from it. Or you know maybe you go out of your way to say hey or say religious experience we can we can uh, just describe this as as a um, as uh, say something 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 that is more to do with uh, with our own hopes and aspirations and maybe the uh, the uh, the constitution of the brain rather than it being say something that matches up to anything uh, real but say for for the most part I'm I'm more sympathetic to the lecturers who do believe that there is, say, some some kind of positive overlap between, say, a defensible metaphysical system and the insights of religion, or, you know, or if you want to put it, say, the, the say, religious feeling. So that certainly is going to be, the, it certainly is the case with uh, Ward's lectures on naturalism agnosticism and his uh, lectures on the realm of ends that he delivered later, and uh, to, to some degree also with uh, space, time, and deity, and and process and reality and so on. I also have here. Uh, oh oh. So so going back to these, say the these two volumes right here. Say naturalism agnosticism. This this was uh, this actually was a posed a little bit of a problem for me. Say this this little guy right here. Say volume two is my most recent acquisition. Uh, say this was delivered just today, and that's because when I when I first ordered say, uh, naturalism agnosticism, I knew that there was a single volume edition that I could get of that. I've seen it before. I'd seen it over at the Cal State Fulton Library. So when I ordered this online, I thought that I was getting that single volume edition. So I wasn't, I wasn't as careful as I should have been. There was no indication from the seller that it was just volume one of two, but I should have checked the page numbers. It did provide how many pages they were, and I should have I should have checked that and make sure that it's not uh, the, the 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 page number is just too small to encompass the full lecture series. So once that arrived, once this arrived, and I, I saw uh, say how how I had been skunked, I I then ordered this one. Now say this volume right here. This is the second edition, and this is the third edition right here. But uh, f fortunately, say the uh, the, the uh, pagination is the same. Say the the index references uh, correspond to uh, the index references here in the third edition correspond to what's in the second edition. So it works fine. And, and as you can see, say they uh, they both are the similar style. Both very beautiful looking volumes. Uh, say they're uh, uh, say the uh, they're intact. The the pages had already been cut, which is nice. 
and I can't wait to finally read them. And also have right here, um, oh, and the reason, uh, say, you know, first, first editions are prohibitively expensive anyway, but if you're looking to get books like these, I strongly advise you to see whether second or third editions might offer you, say, something better. Uh, for instance, say, uh, and I'll get, um, let me actually, let me hold off, because, say, uh, let me hold off talking about that, because when we get to Bozenkat right here, there's something I'm, I want to say about about getting a later edition rather than the second, uh, rather than the first edition that, that can be of great value to the student of philosophy. And, say, the essays, Essays in Philosophy by Ward, say, this was, this is kind of like a memorial volume, this came out after his death. Uh, compiled by his friends um, and uh, and his daughter. A very handsome picture of Professor Ward right there. He, lo he looks a little bit like, uh, oh dear, what is the actor's name? What is the actor's name? But he was the, uh, um, he was uh, one of the, one of the preppers in Tremors. And uh, he was the father in Family Ties. Man, I can't remember his name, but he was—he was the father of Michael J. Fox in that in that movie and then in that show. So, so you, you guys, you guys should be able to remember it. Who it is? I'm blanking on the name right now. Okay, so, so once one, so this one, this one here, I had to, I had to cut the pages on it, and uh, the uh, let's say some 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 pages I did a a better job than others cutting them. Um, see if I could find if I could find one of the uh, disasters right here. Where you can you can see you can see where you can see where the um, uh, say the the cutting the cutting was a little bit rough on this one, and that's not that's not even the worst one. But for, fortunately, I, there's no there's no damage to, to the text. Okay, so moving on to Bosengat. So as I was talking about, say getting uh, slightly later editions can be of a benefit to uh, to the student here because say. For right here, for uh, for the for the second edition of Naturalism Agnosticism, say Ward writes a new introduction to it. He writes, uh, so you can see you can see we have a little bit of foxing right here, but it's okay. Say we have a he he's written a a new introduction right here, and he's added a good deal to the volume. Uh, including a, a great number of, of explanatory notes and, 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 and defenses towards criticisms uh, that, it, that were put forward uh, to the lectures. So, so that, that certainly is a plus right there. That's something that you would not have been able to find in the first edition. And even richer in terms of additional material is Bosenkett's logic right here. So this is this is one of the most uh, sig uh, one of the last significant works in idealist logic, kind of kind of in the in the style of 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 a kind of like an ontological exposition of logic that started with Hegel and progressed onwards to until the development of mathematical logic, um, and. And uh, what what uh, Bosenkett is presenting right here is an example of a coherence theory of logic, truth, and knowledge, and uh, say you know say develop develop you know the coherence theory of truth is say something that is kind of like a, uh, not not exactly spelled out but certainly there in Hegel it's more it's 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 made explicit in H um, H Joachim's uh, nature of truth. And uh, this is this is one of the one of the uh, children of that. Uh, say, Bosenkett was a major major figure in uh, late nineteenth century British philosophy, particularly British idealism. Now, in the first edition, say the first edition, I want to say uh, would have been say from from the eighteen eighties. Say this was this was act, this was actually say one of. Uh, one of Bosenkett's major earlier works right here. But this is the second edition. And the second edition, this this is, if I remember, I, I think it's 1911. Let me just check again on this. 
1911 right here. So notice, notice the years right here. So we are now at the point where, uh, where Russell has been, um, has been, um, has been, say, uh, develop, developing, say, a new mathematical logic, say, you know, from, from Piano and Frege and so on in Great Britain. So, so Bosenket in this edition right here, he has expanded on it a great deal and tries to answer the challenge that the new mathematical logic, the new symbolic logic uh, that is being advanced by Russell and others might pose to uh, an account of, uh, of logic and truth in the style that he's presenting right here. So this is this I would say that's pretty invaluable right there to have something like that. And so again, that wouldn't be found in the first edition, but say if you can if you can check and see if the if the author added anything of value to later editions, I would say I would say get those cuz this was this was pretty expensive right here. I think say uh this two volume right here and this two volume right here were the most expensive acquisitions right here. These I uh, I am confident in saying that both of these were well over a hundred dollars. Say third third uh, you know uh, uh third place goes to Microcosmos right here, which was uh just sixty bucks. But uh, these these guys right here say the reason the reason why there is just this number of books and not more is is thanks thanks to uh, thanks to these guys right here. Okay. Now I also have here say the principle of individuality and va and value, and as you can see, uh, they don't match. Um, it would have it would have been prohibitively expensive for me to get both volumes of Bosenket's lecture series. Um, with the same edition, say what we got right here is a Krauss reprint from the 1960s, and it's still it's um, as far as far as far I can tell, say the the it's a facsimile edition of what the printed page would have looked like uh, in in the earlier editions right here. Let me let me check let me check and see say what the edition number is on this one right here. Okay, 1912. Okay, this might, um, I th think this is first edition right here because uh, this was part of the, the lecture series for 1911. So I think this is first edition right here. But again, I wasn't able to get uh, volume two or, or even a two volume set. You can get, you can get uh, Bosenket's two lectures as a two lecture set. Part, part of the problem is, is that they don't have the uh, the titles uh, aren't uniform as they are right here for for naturalism agnosticism or for space time and deity or for for many another um, Gifford lecture series for whatever reason say Balzenkett decided to give them entirely different titles but they are they are they are uh, part of the same uh, lecture series at um, uh, for the for the Gifford lectures but you know maybe maybe one day. Maybe one day I'll 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 buy say something to match, but it's not it's not really that important. Um, uh, it still it still looks okay is the thing. But and 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 after all, see we're we're not we're not in this for just the aesthetics, are we? We're in here for the content. All right, and the reason why we're getting these old books anyway is just because we say m m there many of them are not in print. They're not in print in. In any new editions, you know, maybe a cheap, cheaper kind of paperback edition, and uh, you can get uh, hardcover reprints done, but they're quite ugly. They're quite ugly, and it's uh, it's, a, it's it can often be a pretty big risk as, as to uh, say what what the what the end product is is going to look like when you purchase it. Purchase it. Okay, so coming up here to the end, so. Uh, once again, say say uh, second edition that uh, doesn't doesn't add quite as much substance as Bosenkett does to the logic, but still still um, uh, answers say some criticisms in 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 uh, footnotes and whatnot. This is Hastings Rational's two volume theory of good and evil. Now Hastings Rational is 
a new name for me. I've only come across him recently while I've been trying to delve a little bit deeper into pluralist idealism. And Hastings Rational, um, uh, say, ni- some nice parallels with uh, with Bishop Barclay right here, because Bishop Barclay, as you probably know, uh, was, um, was um, say, um, well, it was part of, he was, uh, he was a, 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 a bishop in the Church of Ireland, but, uh, you know, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury would still have been, say, the, uh, uh, and, of course, the monarch of Great Britain would still have been the head of his church. But, say, Barclay was a pluralist idealist, you know, he believed that, say, there is nothing in existence except minds and ideas, and Hastings Rashtal was a, 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 uh, also a, a priest in the Anglican Church. And also was a Berklerian, a Berklean idealist. He also believed that there was nothing in ex- existence except minds and ideas. But um, uh, so that's that's interesting stuff for me. I, I I love I love that kind of stuff. You know, I'm I I lean I lean more towards uh, Leibniz and Whitehead. But say, I can still I can still appreciate say a good Berklean idealist as well. Now. Interesting thing here to look at is, say, the dedication page on here. It gives you a kind of an idea of what uh, Hastings Rational's moral philosophy is. In memory of my teachers, Thomas Hill Green and Henry Sidgwick. So if you're familiar with those names, you know that this is, this is kind of an interesting hybrid right here. Say, T.H. Uh, Green was one was pro, say kind of kind of like the 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 uh, the epicenter of British idealism. Everything flowed into Green. Everything flowed out of Green um, in Oxford in the in the the maturation and flowering of British idealism. Uh, Sidgwick, on the other hand, is one of the most notable utilitarian philosophers and developed his own original utilitarian ethics, which is uh, dis- distinct from, from, from Bentham and Mill, but it's still part of the utilitarian tradition. So we have here an idealist, and we have here a utilitarian. And Rashtal's moral philosophy, as I understand it, will be what he will call an ideal utilitarianism. So that sounds interesting. Now, these these uh, these volumes came out. Uh, say, second edition came out in the 1920s. The first volume, the first edition, would have been say from I want to say 1906, either 1906 or 1908, but uh, very close on the heels of G. E. Moore's uh, Principia Ethica. And a lot of things that that I've been reading that uh, uh, you know are 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 critical but appreciative. Of Hastings Rational says that say the Rash Rational is a person who has been sadly neglected, thanks largely to the fact that his his book just came out a couple of years too late. Say had it had it come out the same year or before Moore's Principia Ethica, it might have made as much of an impact in the uh, in the development of moral philosophy as Moore's had, or or that we would at least know Rational better than we do right now. Uh, so I, I find that I find that very interesting, and uh, really really wants me to get into his 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 stuff right here. And I also have a, a smaller volume by Rashtal, uh say on philosophy and religion. Uh, this is this is kind of a this is part of a, a uh, kind of a, a popular series on theology, um, saying this is Rashtal's contribution to it. And I got this because I understand say that in there we get a little bit more of a. Uh, uh, a de- developed exposition of his uh, uh, Berkeleyan metaphysics and and philosophy of knowledge in the mind. So I'm interested in getting that. Okay, finally here at the end, we've got Samuel Alexander's Space, Time, and Deity. Now again, say uh, Samuel Alexander suffers uh, somewhat the same fate as Hastings Rational does is that another philosopher has kind of stolen his thunder or, you know, just we don't we don't know Alexander as well as we should. uh, Thanks to the fact that, say, someone uh, someone uh, um, uh, has has kind of like, you know, uh, eclipsed him. And that person is Alfred North Whitehead. 
Now, unlike Rational, Rational was too late um, in in coming out with his book to uh, to maybe make as much of an impact as he could. Say Alexander's uh, own Gifford series predates Whitehead's process and reality. So so uh, Alex, Alexander has priority right here, at least at least uh, chronologically. But it's it's just it's just that uh, un- unfortunately, say the um, uh, more people have read Whitehead, more people have commented on Whitehead, and Alexander unfortunately has been treated as almost kind of like just a forerunner to Whitehead, and I, I don't I don't I don't like that. I, I think that I think that does a great disservice to um, to Alexander. Uh, I mean, yes, myself, I align myself more much more with. Whitehead than with Alexander, but Alexander is still a first-rate philosopher, a first-rate metaphysician, and I would heartily, heartily recommend him uh, for someone who wants maybe a a spinacistic basis for a process philosophy, a process metaphysics that is, you know, as as scientifically and as and mathematically informed, uh, and. Whitehead's, of course, is more Leibnizian. Whitehead's is is more pluralist, and uh, Whitehead is also um, more of a panpsychist. Uh, you know, where where um, say every everything in reality has some some subjective aspect to it, not consciousness. This is this is a mistake people often make about say panpsychism that they think oh that means that everything is conscious. No, it said everything has some kind of subjective activity to it, and you know. For the most part, not conscious. So, but that so that's Whitehead, but that's not going to be the case with Alexander right here. Uh, with Alexander, say um, say subjective qualities are uh, emerge from uh, from from space time as say say something something that um, uh, is kind of almost kind of like inexplicable, and that's interesting to me. Say the fact that say that the mind develops. From these, uh, from these cosmological conditions, but is not reducible to it. It is actually kind of like a uh, a brand new addition to it. And say Alexander's uh, Spinacism, and also the fact that say that Alexander is a philosopher of events, and the fact that say Alexander uh, also uh, develops a, a a a kind of like a, a metaphysical system where where Say qualities are not reducible to uh, to one another in a kind of like a hierarchy of development makes me makes me think that that people who read Deleuze should look really closely at Samuel Alexander and and Deleuze has referenced Alexander in his lectures on Leibniz and he he called Alexander the the one really really great philosopher to ever come out of Australia. Now I can't say whether whether Alexander is the one really really great philosopher to ever come out of Australia, but I will agree with Deleuze that he is a really really great philosopher. Now, as you can see, these are these are um, uh, later editions than what we've got right here. Say the uh, the old the say the uh, you know apart from the Krauss lecture uh, Krauss reprint that came out in the nineteen sixties, the youngest. Uh, the youngest kid here are the rational theory of good and evil that came out in the night. Uh, say this edition came out in the 1920s. Say this is say a Macmillan reprint that came out in I want to say 1966, and this is a Dover paperback edition that came out at the same time. And the reason why they're different, I really wanted to get the Dover edition. I really wanted to get the Dover ship for, for, reason, for reasons that are both practical and aesthetical. Practical because uh, it was, per, uh, again, prohibitively expensive for me to get first editions. And also Dover editions. If anyone has ever gotten Dover editions of anything, you know, say they, uh, Dover lives up to the boast here at the bottom. A Dover edition designed for years of use, exclamation point. And and they they do stand up to the test of time. They are they are bound. They are not just glued uh, the pages into the volume. So you know we we say you know it's it, they're always they're always sturdy, and uh, you know you don't have 
pages just just falling out or the spines cracking or anything like that. Uh, so uh, so they're durable, but also I really love the cover. I really love the cover, and we have say the same thing over here with the Macmillan edition. I uh, say we have the the bust of Alexander, which was done by uh, Epstein. What was Epstein's first name? I can't remember Epstein's first name. Um, but the bust is over at the University of Manchester, where Alexander taught. And I believe the building is called the Samuel Alexander Building. Uh, I, I think I've even heard it referenced as the Sam Alex Building. So if anyone is a student at the University of Manchester, they can go into the Sam Alex Building and see the bust of Alexander right there which um, there's also a photograph of, of the unveiling of the bust, and you can see Samuel Alexander standing right next to it, and uh, it's, a, it's a very cute picture. Okay, so for, for, for both uh, uh, reasons of money and of durability and aesthetics, say this is why we have, say, these later editions right here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, uh, have Gene put some, um, put some cellophane over here so I don't get the, uh, the cover damaged anymore. Than it already is, and uh, I don't. I don't mind. I don't mind that uh, that they're that they're different because again, say you know, <laughs> we're talking about say the 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 emergence of of difference, um, uh, uh, you know, of uh, of thing of thing of things coming coming into being that are not already implicated in um, in the, the the manifold of space time already. I think there's something maybe possibly appropriate there. I don't know. Anyway, so those are the books that I got with my last paycheck. Maybe I'll show you the stuff that I'll get with uh, with future ones. I got some more stuff that I, I really want to get. I want to get um, Bradley's, F.H. Uh, Bradley's Principles of Logic. I want to get his ethical studies. Uh, I don't uh, say, I talked a good deal about T.H. Green. I don't have any T.H. Green. I need, I need to get, say, some, uh, say, uh, his, his uh, uh, seminal work. Uh, so going to get Green, going to get Bradley, uh, maybe, uh, maybe some, uh, some A.E. Taylor and maybe some Pringle Patterson. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe we'll have some surprises right here. Maybe some Dorothy Emmett, uh, and who else? Oh, Bran Blanchard. Bran Blanchard, who also has a two volume, um, two volume Gifford edition that I, uh, Gifford lectures that I want to get. And uh, who else? Who is the, the other one I really need? Oh, okay. I also mentioned H.H. Joachim. I also really want to get his stuff too. Okay. So thank you for tearing along with me. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, uh, let me know about your own book adventures. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.